Thank you everyone for attending our webinar here today. Today we're going to be talking about going beyond technology to deliver better customer service. I'm very excited to have a special guest here with me today who I will introduce in just a moment. But before we go any further, I just want to talk a little bit about our forward-looking statement here at Salesforce. As you know, Salesforce is a publicly traded company, and so we might get a little excited and talk about the future. And if we do that, we encourage you to make any purchasing decisions based on currently available products. With that, I'd like to introduce Brent Leary. Brent, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, first of all, Becca, thanks for having me join you today. This is great. Uh, I am Brent Leary, uh, co-founder and partner of CRM Essentials, based here in Atlanta. And we focus a lot around understanding how businesses of all sizes, but particularly SMBs, can use some of the later and greatest, latest and greatest technologies to help them, as I like to say, find, catch, and keep good customers. Uh, so I'm really excited about the, this topic today because this probably is the, the best way to, to start going about that. And I'm Becca Kraft. I'm a director of product marketing here at Desk. So thank you very much for joining us, Brent. I think we're going to have a great conversation. For everyone on the webinar, I want to make sure that you're aware that we're going to be taking questions at the end. So if you have any questions that you'd like to share, please use the chat window, and I will be going through that so that Brent and I can talk about some of the, your burning questions. Also be aware that we are recording this webinar so that we will be able to send you a recording of the webinar when it's over. So, uh, so if you have to jump off or you have insights that you'd like to share with someone else, you will have a video recording of the webinar to be able to do that. With that, let's jump right in because the topic today is really customer service and customer experience, but there's a lot of confusion between those two. And so I thought, Brent, it would be a great opportunity for you to talk a little bit about what does a great customer experience mean? Yeah, thanks for that. And actually, it's kind of ironic uh, because um, uh, where I'm actually doing this webinar from today, um, I'm here in Atlanta and sitting at the local uh, NBC affiliate uh, to do to record the next Atlanta Tech Ed show. So we're talking about technology and things of that nature. And uh, the thing that I'm actually going to be talking about, the Amazon Echo. And it's one of those devices that uh, is still kind of new on the scene. I got mine in November of 2014 when they first came out. And what it is, if you're not kind of familiar with it, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's like a speaker that you can attached to your Wi-Fi network at home so you can you know play records and or music and things of that nature but it's over time it's allowing you to do more and more things so not only do you play your uh, music from your Spotify account uh, you can actually order a Domino's pizza <laughs> by speaking to it just say hey Alexa order my latest Domino order uh, you can use it with your Fitbit so you can access Hey Alexa, how many steps do I have today? And the, the Fitbit integration will allow Alexa to tell you you have 6,000 steps or whatever the number of steps it is. You can even order an Uber ride by using this thing now. So what the, the cool thing about it is more and more of, my, uh, of the things I do are actually coming through Alexa when I'm at home. And so that's, a, that's allowing me to actually adapt my lifestyle to take advantage of these capabilities. So it's allowed me to have these different kinds of experiences uh, that allow me to live my life a little easier. And so that's, that's one of the things around experiences as not just a customer, but actually just as a human being. And so using the Amazon device that they put together to not just transact with Amazon or communicate with Amazon, but to use that device to do other things that make my life easier it's kind of a great way to think about experiences, not just customer ex uh, experiences, but other life experiences that is making my life overall a lot better. So that's why I like looking at uh, things like customer experience. Yeah, part of that is customer service and being able to get the good response when needed, but it's also, and I think you're seeing a lot more successful companies looking at how can we not just stop at that level of, of the relationship where the experiences we're trying to you know, create 
are making it easier for us to do business with with our consumers but actually how can we use our our experiences and our technology to provide our customers the ability to go beyond just good experience with us but to create better experiences for them in general so that their overall life is a little easier a little uh, happier so that's why i love this idea of customer experience is incredibly important um it's a important from a service perspective we want great service when we need it we want to be able to get the answers when we need it but it's only a subset of the overall customer or even life experience that everybody has in their everyday life well and it's not just alexa that can worm her way into your life i know that there's <laughs> a lot of companies that are transforming the way that customers experience things that they've been used to in the past. And I know you have a lot of experience thinking about uh, cars and Carvana. I like cars. You, you got me there, but I love my cars. <laughs> but one of the things that I don't really like, and I think a lot of people don't like, is going through the process of buying a car, and in particular, used car. We, we know the, the term, the, the used car salesman, and kind of the last person you want to deal with. And, and so there's some kind of negative connotations around buying used cars. The interesting Very thing is this company here. Yeah. The interesting thing is there's this company, it's a, only a three-year-old company called Carvana. And what they did is they wanted to change the perception and change the kind of experiences that we have when we have to buy a used car, we want to buy a used car. So what they did is they looked at everything that went into uh, each facet of the used car buying experience. And they, they wanted to make use technology, social and mobile and web to turn that debt into a positive experience. So uh, when you're looking for the kind of car, you're looking for the information about the car, you're looking for financing for the car, uh, even the, the, the service experiences, they leveraged everything that we have in modern technology to create a better experience that had the customer in, in, in mind right from the beginning. So what they did was they created this site, Carvana.com, where you can go and do everything you need to, to get to look at a car, get the information about the car, look at options, look at financing options, and then you can actually sign off. And they say that 20% of their customer base is able to go through that whole process, meaning they're able to get all the information they need, feel comfortable enough to buy a car online, not just a, a book, but a car online, and make sure that they, they have the kind of experience they need. They can go through that process in 20 minutes, uh, you know, which is fascinating. And then at the end of that, you, they can even have the whole car, the car delivered to you, or if you live somewhere and like I do here in Atlanta, they actually have in Midtown Atlanta a car vending machine. So you can they'll send oh, you wow. a, yeah, they'll send you a coin, a, like a big coin, and then you can take that coin to the car vending machine in Midtown Atlanta. And it's just like you're buying a, a Coke from a, a vending machine. You put the coin in, and now all of a sudden you see that they go and, and get the car, and it's a man, I mean, it's an automatic process. So you see cars shifting around until they find your car, and then they bring that car down on an escalator or a, some sort of a lift, and, and you basically get the car. So what they did was concentrate on the experience that would make folks more comfortable about buying a used car on the, on the web, and they've gone from 4.5 million in revenue in year one, which is 2013, and to 2015, they said they made about 145 million in revenue. So that tells wow. you that if you create the right experiences, uh, even though there probably would be some apprehension up front because how many people have bought a used car like that before? But look, if you create the right experiences, you get the right end results. You get customers willing to do it, and you have a business model that's generating some nice revenue. So it's like a win-win if you could get it right. That's a tremendous new experience. I mean, when we think about customer experience and that ability to grow and outperform, we're not really just talking about service. We're talking about taking a new approach and arguably a transformational approach to things that we as customers think 
are just the status quo and the way it's always going to be. Yeah, and I think you're, what you're seeing are smart companies that kind of understand that uh, customers today are adopting this great technology that's coming about. They're, they're doing it at quicker and quicker rates. They're being more explorative and, and seeing what this technology can do. And then once they do that, then they're really uh, quick to adapt their lifestyles to take advantage of it. So they're looking for uh, companies that provide them the kind of ex experiences that will make it easier for them to do things and more, uh, more uh, pleasurable to do things. And so the companies that are able to make that transition or in certain instances, companies that are brand new, they come at this with customer centricity at the heart of the business model, customer service at the heart of the business model. So it's baked in from the beginning. So they don't even have to transition. They already have it as part of their core business. So if you're able to put that in the center, either through the transformation or right from the beginning, you're able to, to reap uh, benefits because customers are seeking out the kind of companies that are looking out for what they call making it easier for them to basically ad adopt this stuff and use it to have their lives easier. And so if you're able to do that, regardless of transformation or at the beginning, you can see the what happens, uh, and this is just sort of one marker that we found this one stat, that companies that are viewed as customer experience leaders that are putting the customer at the heart of the business model and, and service at the heart of the business model and using technology to implement uh, experiences that not only do the customers come out at, 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 on the end in a, a much better place, but the companies do too. Now, this is looking at some of the, the kind of the larger companies, but look, the companies that are viewed as CX leaders, their stock price has gone up 77.7%. If you're just kind of the average, looking at the average for the S&P, that's, that's much further above the 51.5%, but look at the folks who are seen as customer experience laggers that are slow to respond. And I think the worst thing you can be to, to be in this kind of environment, this kind of economy, is slow to respond to what customer needs and expectations and behaviors are doing. But if you are in that bucket, look, you're 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 got a negative performance over that span of time. So I think it's it's just critical today to understand that you have to look at customer service, customer experience, and even the customer service and experiences that you think were working a year ago. <laughs> chances are they may not be enough today because not that you've changed, but the ex expectations and the behaviors of customers have changed. Yeah, being stagnant when it comes to that experience can be really, really dangerous if you're not willing to adjust. But one of the things that we hear a lot is customer experience and customer service used sort of synonymously. So I think that it's a great opportunity to ask really, what's the difference between customer experience and customer service? So what's really good about this is that there are the crossover, but there's the even subsets because a customer experience can take place not just from the service perspective, you know, that they need something done immediately, but it, it's a part of the overall interactions that a customer has with an organization. Some of that may be through the marketing and the branding and the messaging that happens that may turn off a potential customer if it's not done the right way or if it's not delivered in the right format or the right channel. All these are experiences that take place before they're even a customer. Uh, if they are interested in what they see, then you have to go through the sales process. Once again, we're still not at customer service, but now there's experience. It's the buying experience. And so there's stages and activities that have to take place and you want to make sure that you're you're creating the right uh, buying experience for them so that you have the right selling experience to close the deal so you have those kind of marketing experiences you have those kind of sales experiences and then you have those that happen after they become a, cu a customer and, and once again the, it's not just that it's a one and done kind of thing. Once they become a customer, oh, it's, you know, now we change the tune completely. It's how do we leverage what we know about that customer that, that we learn through our marketing and that we learn through the sales process 
how can we leverage that information to make sure that we're creating the right kind of customer experiences? So once again, customer service is an incredibly important part, but it's only a part of the overall customer experience. Yeah, that, that piece around customer experience that's driven by service execution, I'm glad you brought up those buying moments because I know the, the research really backs all of this stuff up where customers are making their purchasing decisions not necessarily based on price, which is what uh, has been sort of the ethos for so long is that, well, if we have a lower price than our competitor, then folks will choose us. They're not even necessarily choosing to do business with uh, companies based on the products that they deliver. So it's no longer enough for products to be your differentiator. But this customer experience, which is the all of those elements around the marketing experience, the, the buying and purchasing experience, and even if you're not getting customer service uh, before you buy, you probably hear about the experience that your colleagues or friends are having as part of their customer service experience. That becomes part of the brand. And this customer experience is a number one driver and a key brand differentiator for so many companies, which is why it's so critical to pay attention to. And then the service execution piece is, uh, is a lot about keeping your customers that they can depend on you. That, you know, if you're a customer and I want what I want when I want it, <laughs> the company I do business with can help me with that. Well, in, in all actuality, customers have always wanted this. They've always wanted what they wanted when they wanted it. But before, you know, five, ten years ago, it was they didn't have as much power over having that come true. Uh, their, the power was really stored in the organizations and, and the organizations kind of control the means of communication, and all the things that kind of go into that having the power. But now because of the web, because things are democratized, because uh, technology is more affordable by consumers and they're more uh, accepting and looking for, you know, be, before maybe it would, the user adoption would take a certain amount of time, but now it's that time has been shrunk because people are seeing what the technology can do for them. And so now the power is definitely shifted over to the consumer. And, and now they're demanding, I want what I want when I want it. And now that companies have to react before they didn't. Now they do because there's a lot of competitors out there and if you don't react, somebody else will. So that's, it's, it's uh, not just the big kind of uh, companies that'll, that are competitors, but these smaller, nimble startups. I mean, who would have thought three years ago? Uh, I mean, I don't even think I had heard of Uber three or four years ago. And now it's completely disrupted the way people get around. And, and the poor you know, taxi companies are, are trying to figure out what happened to them. Uh, but that's because we want what we want when we want it. Uber figured out how to deliver that. The taxi companies are still trying to catch up. And you're still using Uber, right? Of course. <laughs> You're still you can, but the good thing is Uber is still looking at how they can provide better experiences. They're not just sitting on their laurels saying, hey, we disrupted the taxis, now we're good. No, they're, they're looking at how they can use data to provide even better, more uh, greater experiences. Just like Amazon is doing the same thing. Remember, two-day delivery was great. Now they got 30-minute or hour delivery in some places because they know our expectations are changing and getting amped up, and they have to be able to respond to that. It's a fair point. And when we think about customer service as a subset of that customer experience, it's all about helping customers be able to feel that love. You know, that's the way that you, you get people, you get customers to trust you. you if you provide, if they, if you, if they feel like you're only interested in their wallet or you're only interested, interested, interested in the transaction, uh, you're not building trust. You're just, you know, you're, you're collecting some one-off transactions. What we want to do as, cus as a business people is we want our customers to, to trust that we have their best interest at heart, that we're interested in, beyond just the one transaction, that we value their opinion and, and will not only value their opinion, we'll actually try to look for ways to put their opinions in play because 
that should create better products and services and that should also keep them as customers longer. So that stat is incredibly important and you have to think beyond the transaction if you really want customers to trust you and view you as a, a someone that they can feel comfortable about being a brand advocate and be your customer for a long amount of time. So you got to go beyond the transaction. You got to think bigger. So I'm really glad you said beyond the transaction. How do you get beyond the transaction? Where do you start building a better experience, especially when it comes to service? Well, I think this is the, the best opportunity, particularly for, for smaller companies uh, and even the companies that are more traditional in nature. They have uh, those face-to-face -face relationships with a lot of their current customers. And their current customers are, have a lot of information that I bet they'd be willing to share if you just ask. So I think getting, you know, being, uh, looking for customer feedback putting in a, maybe a more formalized process for getting customer feedback, being able to do things so that once you get that information, you can look at it, analyze it, see how it could help you know, the customer, see how it could help your business. But the key is, let's, let's listen to what they say, not just the, their wallets, but let's really pay attention. Let's you know, see how they can help us improve because if, they're able to, if we're able to take that information and leverage it, not only are we gonna be able to create better products and services that are more personalized or customized to their needs, but we're also basically creating a brand advocacy program because guess what? If they feel like you're listening to them and you're putting their thoughts and their opinions into better products and services, they're going to talk about it. And we all know the importance of great reviews, great ratings, great word of mouth. So this is a great first step if you haven't done it, you know, not just a one-off, hey, how, how is this or how you're doing, but how do we get our whole organization to start functioning as a feedback group and be able to take it, aggregate it, and use that information to drive big uh, opportunities. So I feel like that's, that's a lot of feedback, but how do you build that into your culture? Do you have some suggestions for that? Yeah, and it, it does start with having, you know, the, the folks at the top really be passionate and interested in what is driving the customer. You know, before we would, you know, when people start a business, you know, the whole, they'll build a widget, and they'll sell the widget, and they'll sell enough of the widgets, and then they'll start getting um, you know, calls, hey, the widget isn't working, so then they gotta figure out, well, how do we service the widgets? But today, you really wanna have a, a customer first, and I call it a service first culture and mentality, which means that you know, you, every question, everything you do is focused not so much on the widget itself, but on the customer and how the customer you know, would need it, would use it, would, uh, how the customer would evolve over time, what the customer needs today, what the customer is gonna need you know, tomorrow and the next day. And we put together you know, those listening platforms so you can listen to what's important. You know, they're telling their people on social networks what's interesting to them, what's important to them, you know, what they need, what they like, what they dislike, so you can use the, you know, the social listening tools to, to pick up on that. But you can also ask. You can be uh, you know, really programmatic and asking, hey, what, what do you like about this? What don't you like? What would you like to see? Who would you like to see? So creating a culture that is really one that's listening and one that's inquisitive about what's driving the customer instead of what's going to sell us more products. Because if you do the what's going to drive the customer, chances are you're going to sell more products because you're going to know what's important to them and when it's important to them and the best way to communicate with them. That's awesome. We're getting some really great questions uh, from folks coming through, and I know we will get to these questions towards the end. Um, but I know that one of the things, Brent, that you and I have talked about is that when you're thinking about re-examining customer experience, that can feel like a massive, massive mountain that you're trying to move. When, when you and I talk about this, you and I think about 
these key points of interaction and really focusing on two or three of those. How do you go about finding which ones those are? Yeah, and it could feel overwhelming, particularly if you're a, a more traditional business that hasn't been birthed, so to speak, in the, uh, the digital age, the social age. But it, it's, I think it's most important just to start small and, and start with, you know, what's driving, what are maybe the two or three most important things that are driving our, you know, our customers today? How can we find that out? How can we just concentrate on those key big things? And then how can we figure out the best way to go about getting that information? And then how can we go about acting on that information? So let's not try to boil the ocean. Let's just focus on the top two, top three things, you know, asking our customers, listening to them on social, and try to understand what's driving them right now. And then analyze, find the insights, find the things that we think are going to be critically important to them. And then how can we deliver you know, on programs, products, services, interactions that help you know, connect us to them? Because quite honestly, if we're not being totally focused on the, what's their kind of the, the thing, their thing of the day, their top important issue, which they're going to be completely focused on. If we're not focused on that and we're just shooting out, hey, we have great products, we got great services, we're going to be like the vast majority of everybody else and, you know, flooding their tweet streams and their inboxes with basically stuff that's not interesting to them at that point in time. So if we're able to concentrate on those two or three things, listen, ask, analyze, find out what's important, find out the best way to communicate back to them. Hey, we know you're interested in this. We think we can help you with that. You're, you're going to be lost. So that's the quick two or three things. And what's the important thing today? What are the important things today? How can we listen for out for those? How can we gather that? How can we analyze that? and make sure that we're totally understanding what's important to them and then use some empathy before we just blast back hey we're the greatest at this no let's think about well how how is it the best way to to uh show them that we understand what they're going through and have some solutions so there's a lot of things that go into that well and then if you're really focused on those key points of interaction it's a lot easier to uncover your trends and adjust really quickly because it doesn't take that much data for you to be able to start identifying some trends. You're, you're right. And it, it, it's really kind of e a lot easier than I think people understand because the things that are important to our customers, they're willing to talk about it. Either they're going to leave a review on Yelp or some other review site, or they're going to you know, have some sort of an exchange with their friends and family on Facebook, Twitter, or they're going to be asking their colleagues on one of those social channels, hey, what are you guys doing in this area? That all that stuff adds up. And so if you if you listen for that, but also you're proactive and you're asking, you know, when you have the opportunity, you know, not to send out a full blown 30 you know, question survey, but maybe just asking, hey, what, what's what are you what's important to you today? What what are you kind of working with? What's kind of the challenge you have? Uh, you you'd be surprised at how much great information you get. So you're right. You don't need a ton to start out with. You need the right information at the right time from the right people. And then when you have everyone on board, if you've got every employee and everybody who is on the front lines of interacting with customers, empowered to ask those questions, capture that data so that they can also make suggestions and try some different things, you have a great opportunity to uncover what's really going to work for your business. Uh, that's really important because you have to be able to, it, it, this isn't a one person job. If, if, if you have a group of people that are interacting or involved with you know, the fine catch and keep processes that a customer goes through throughout their life cycle, you have to have every one of those people involved. And so you want to be able to, uh, to make it easy for them to gather that kind of information, 
but you also want to make sure that everybody's on the same page that they're, you're asking the same question regardless of who the person is that's asking it as long as they're a part of the organization you, you have to make make it clear that hey this is what we're you know, we think we need uh to be asking right now get their feedback ask them if that's true if we need to be doing something else and then incorporate it but then make sure everybody across the board is on the same page because if you're able to do that then you're able to scale up that inf the efforts to understand your customer it'll be uh an aggregate it won't be you know this guy is asking this person this thing and this you know person is asking this thing we're all getting the same information we can all aggregate we can then feel comfortable and confident that we have a good understanding of what's important to our customers today and that then will allow you to start creating those interaction opportunities those experiences or those products and services that will address those exact concerns. That's awesome. Well, so when, when we think about a customer-centric culture, we've, we've talked a little bit about making sure that you have standard structure and process for feedback and all of these things, but a lot of that ties back to becoming really customer-centric in the way that you approach your customer service environment and even your entire business. So I know when you and I have talked, we've discussed three different kinds of businesses, and I want to make sure that we talk a little bit about how you take a customer-centric approach and culture in traditional businesses when you're thinking about a startup, and also maybe even most importantly in a subscription model. Uh, and we'll talk about each of those three in turn. Yeah. But let's start by talking about customer-centric culture in a traditional business. Yeah, I, I think these folks are maybe the ones that are, are kind of struggling a little bit of it more, more than the other two, um, but it's incredibly important for them to go through the process of it's, it's, a, it's kind of a transformation because they were kind of born before all this stuff kind of took place. But it's really important and it does start at the top and, it, and they have the ability to capitalize on those relationships that they've built over the years with their customers. They, a lot of instances, they have personal relationships. So, uh, and it, it may be, you know, the opportunity to take that manual kind of uh, approach that they've had over the years to their customers, to building those relationships and trying to find ways to uh, standardize across people so it's just it's not one person that has kind of been great at this and and, and continuing to be great at building those relationships but having having a way to take the things that that per person does great and and teaching that across the board and then finding you know, systems to help automate certain processes around relationship building around customer service you know, using the tools like this to help make sure that they are capturing all of the the uh, customer inquiries that are coming in and making sure they get to the right person in a timely fashion. So a lot of instances, it's about all those great things you do manually and beginning to automate those and making sure that as you bring more people on, more people on, that you have you know processes in place that will make it easy for them to get up to speed with what needs to be done uh, so that's kind of the, the the traditional folks i think is you know let's help them automate all the great stuff that they do and that means that does mean and i love this slide that you're pulling up that does mean some training that does mean you know making sure you have the right technology but it also does mean making sure that your employees have what they need uh, from a training and a technology, but from other, you know, they feel like they're, you know, involved in the process. They're they're helping to make decisions, or they're they're helping to shape what the direction. So it does call for making sure that you you when you're automating and you're bringing in some technology that you're training your people and you're giving them the power to engage the audience in the way the customer base that will make sense that will help drive those relationships. That's, I think that's the main thing from the traditional standpoint. Uh, now, if we look at the startup folks, 
these folks are born with the technology, you know, kind of as part of their, you know, in their DNA, so to speak. So they need to make sure that as they look at some of the more traditional uh, kind of businesses and their approaches, they're, they're trying to figure out there's some, some good, good insight that can come from you know, those traditional businesses, but let's look at how we can transform and make processes better. We're not constrained by maybe some of the, the, uh, the technology that's been built into the company. Or, or some of the policies that came out of you know the early days that now because they they've been used for so long that it's it's really just hard to get past it. So these folks are able to look at technology, look at the processes that can make it easy to do good from A to B, that can <clears throat> allow them to be more uh, collaborative in nature, but also be able to transform what's done because they don't have the baggage of old uh, kind of cultures or old kind of processes. So they can get up and going a lot quicker and get concentrated on transforming processes, adding processes, taking away processes that allow them to create the kind of experiences throughout the customer life cycle that will allow them to quickly get customers and quickly show those customers that they know what they're doing, that they, they can cut down and be more efficient than the traditional kind of folks and build those long time lasting relationships. Uh, so I yeah, love we're those. Seeing, <laughs> we're seeing in more and more startup companies that when the faster that they can get out of spreadsheets and the faster that they can get out of a shared inbox, the more quickly they can actually be agile and transform these experiences that they're capable of delivering. Which is why to be able to connect into your customer's life, it's more about the transformation that you can uh, that you can impact and technology plays such a huge role in that in automating and making sure that you have the processes in place to scale and be successful. Yeah, that, that's great. And, and I think you said it right. The startup guys, they're involved in transforming ex uh, the experiences, whereas the traditional folks have to transform culture and before they could get to the transformation of experiences. So they, they do have a little less uh, things to fight through, which allows them to get there faster and quicker and even more effectively. Yeah. Well, and the last one is a subscription business. You know, we're, see, we're seeing more and more of these develop in so many different areas of life these days. And fundamentally, a subscription business relies on the lifetime value of a customer. So I feel like service is, uh, is absolutely critical to making sure that that works, right? Absolutely. So where traditional businesses were born with the widget kind of at the center and everything kind of, kind of grew out of you know, building the widget, selling the widget, selling enough of the widgets, that then we have to worry about people calling. With the subscription model, you have to have the service, customer service model baked in right at the beginning of the business model because if you're basically your proposition is we have to provide enough value for every month so that people will be able to put up their money every month they could stop whenever they don't see the value that means that we're not going to have them as customers so we could be one one month and done so you have to have the service model figured out you know, and, and implement it at the very beginning of the business because customers, and it's, it's showing, we are subscribing to more and more things throughout our lives. It's not just Netflix or it's not just Amazon Prime. You know, people are subscribing to airplane flights, sh shaving stuff. I mean, you, you can yeah. pretty much subscribe to anything today. So every one of those subscription models has to have customer service at its heart or people are going to fall off more than they're going to be coming on board. And that's, we, we talk about customer lifetime value. We talk about uh, the, the whole annual recurring revenue. It all is a, those things measure the, the health of the subscription business. But the important thing is you can't even go to market really in a subscription model if you don't have your service model at the heart, because if you're not, really focusing on the customer need, 
beyond the transaction? What are they going to need in terms of, you know, information in terms of value creation? You know, how is that going to trend over time and how are you going to deliver that through your subscription? Then it's just not going to work. You're, you're going to fail faster than the traditional business is going to fail. Awesome. Well, when we start thinking about next steps and how do you actually implement or do any of these things, I feel like there's some big categories that we want to talk about, but the first piece is that structure piece. Yeah, and, and I had a chance to do a, a research project over the last five years with the folks over at Social Media Today, and we were really focused in on how our companies of all sizes integrating social and mobile into their customer service strategy. And what we found is that the folks who are really uh, finding success that they're seeing positive impact, very positive impact on their goals and objectives, depend, didn't really necessarily worry about the size, but size did play a, a bit of a, a role. But the ones who are finding the best success were the ones that were able to share the insights that were coming from those service interactions. So when customers were needing help and were calling or emailing or chatting or using social, uh, but those interactions, those are some of the most important interactions for the life of a company. And so being able to share those interactions, not just with the other parts of the service organization, but with other parts of the organization, with marketing, with sales, with product development, if they're able to take that information and leverage it through all those different areas, they saw much higher uh, impact on overall success of the company by way of their goals, their corporate goals and objectives being met. So that process for sharing service insights, being able to have an organization that has a, a formal way of taking those service interactions, that, all that great insights that come out of that, and moving it across the other facets of the organization created a more cohesive understanding of the customer and that allowed for better experiences across the customer life cycle. That's critically important going forward. Yeah, I've, you're, you're hitting on all of the pieces that you want to build some structure around when you think about those key points of interaction. All of the metrics, all the feedback, all of those processes to really standardize and systematize the way that you share information across an organization and take the insights out of support to feed the business. Yeah, and, and sometimes it sounds like this is all, you know, kumbaya-ish kind of stuff, but it really <laughs> is, it's, it's really important. Uh, if, you, if you have not only a passion for customer uh, behavior and success and trying to make them as, as happy as possible, Having a passion is great, but having the processes and having the, the structure in place to make it happen is, is as important or might more so uh, because if, you're, if, if you don't have that in place, you're not able to keep customers happy. They're going to leave. They're going to say things. And it's not just enough about passion. It's gonna, you have to marry that passion with the right processes or with the right structures in place, measuring for success. You know, it's not just the traditional metrics that uh, are important. Um, we know that customer lifetime value is, very, is really incredibly important. But in today's world, it's, it's sometimes it's not even the folks who are actually buying that are the most influential. So how do you measure uh, somebody's influence and how that influence translates to financials? You have to figure that out as well. Or the community, there's, you know, how is somebody who's really active in, in helping us, they may not even be buying, but they're, they're, uh, they're helpful in the sense that they answer questions really quickly and great, they're thorough with it. Or if somebody left a great review and they may have just done a one-off transaction, but their review has led to several kind of transactions, how do you measure for that? So it's, it's important to, to look at the traditional metrics, but it's also important to implement some newer metrics that will allow you to have a much better understanding of what's driving the business, what's driving uh, you know, the, the forward with the business, who's helping, and it may not be the traditional help that we're used to measure. I think that's really, really good insight. I think 
one of the things that I'm I'm currently officially opening it up for questions, folks. So please keep your questions coming. One of the themes that I'm seeing in the questions coming through are asking for a few examples around the kind, uh, the way you want to build a process to uh, connect these different silos. Uh, can you can you give us an example? Yeah, I think it's important to have um, representatives of you know your your marketing folks, your sales folks, and your service folks, and even your product development folks. You want representation uh, and and allowing those people to get their hands on the actual. You know, if you're doing the social listening, bring that information in, aggregating that information, and then allowing these all these these different kinds of people to analyze that information because they'll be able to tell you from their perspective what it you know how it's impacting what they're doing how they think it's impacting the customer experience and and, and also have um some actual customers represented in this process too it, it doesn't have to be extremely formal but you want to have the right roles the right people involved looking at this information and then providing their their uh, pers perspective on it because you want to take everybody's perspective so you you want the data and then you want to, to let them analyze it and then you want those, those them to bring their perspectives in and and then you will have a, a much clearer picture from the people after they've analyzed things to to see what what should, what's going to move the customer what is important how do we do this and then you help and you know you use your processes to make sure that happens but it's really important to be at the beginning to, to take in and once again focus on those top two or three things that seem to be driving you know the, the the what's in front of the customer but then you know really going deep on those two or three things to analyze from every perspective that's important and then let's come up with a, an interaction plan an experience you know plan a plan of, of actually making sure that we dictate or we show these people that we understand what's important and here's how we can help because if you don't cover it from all the sides you're gonna you may leave out something that could be critical and we drop the ball before you even get a chance to throw it over to them. awesome we've got another sort of theme in these questions around uh, motivating and incentivizing employees uh, so I, I want to ask Two different questions about this. Uh, the first relates specifically to the way that you build feedback into um, into the employee process. So we had a pretty specific question about how, what kinds of incentives can you offer that are outside of traditional sort of money, money bonuses to get employees excited about this feedback. Yeah, well, you've seen this whole idea of the kind of the gamification, where you know you get you get points uh, for you know coming up with great suggestions, or you know you're handling the interaction with customers really effectively. You're getting customers to leave reviews, and if you're the one that leave, let, gives them the, uh, the you know the incentive to, to review, then you get some some points. And in a lot of instances. Uh, folks are are just as happy with getting these points, and maybe these points are used for days off or extra time. Not just always more money, but uh, this is this kind of goes back to understanding what drives your employees as well as what drives your customers. Because once again, if you're listening to your your employees, maybe they'll tell you things that they really treasure and and want that you didn't even think of that will will fit like really nicely into you know the the ability to give them some sort of a uh, you know a, a positive for what they're doing and how they're interacting so yeah maybe money is some some folks like money some folks like time some folks you know want to be able to get a uh, an amazon echo <laughs> I don't know, maybe you know <laughs> some sort of a loyalty program for your for your and for your employees that allows them to kind of pick and choose the things they want so it, once again it kind of goes back to Let's not come from the mountaintop and dictate this is what they're going to get. Why don't we, you know, kind of ask them and kind of see what's important to them and try to figure out ways to use maybe gamification of some sort. But let's let's really try to figure out some new creative ways 
to address them so that we are sparking them to, 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 to work with their customers in a way that'll allow our customers to feel like they're getting the kind of experiences they want. Yeah, and sometimes for employees, the best thing you can do is just let them know that you want to hear from them. Um, so maybe that sort of notion of being open to feedback expands beyond being open to feedback from your customers, but also being open to feedback from your employees. Yeah, we remember the old traditional, uh, if you, you get a good idea, just leave your good idea in the little box. And if we like your idea, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll tell everybody it was your idea. That Some of this stuff is, you know, just because the technology has changed, that doesn't mean that some of the things, the strategies need to change. Some of those strategies were great back then and can be actually, you know, implemented today and maybe even become bigger because of the technology. But those, some of those strategies are still as good as they were, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. So uh, we have another question about employees. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit of a different take. Um, do you have any suggestions or processes that you would encourage for building a customer-centric culture in a multicultural environment? Wow. I know, yeah, right? That, Isn't that a great question? That is a, that's a big one. And, and you know, it, it, there's some, I guess, some additional layers of complexity that are involved. Is it multicultural? I don't know, maybe it's multi-countries involved, multiple countries, multiple languages. Um, I think, you know, you have to understand where your employees are coming from, regardless of, you know, where, where they are, in, you know, from a location standpoint, but uh, having the best understanding of, you, you know, your overall company, your employees, what drives them should help you to kind of navigate that. It's going to be a little more difficult um, just because of, you know, those added layers of complexity. But if you're serious about understanding your customers and you're serious about understanding how your employees can impact you know, that customer engagement, then you're going to be interested in your employees and trying to find ways to, to help make their jobs easier, regardless of if it's a, some sort of a cultural uh, opportunity or if it's uh, just a, a, a technical or a policy driven. Uh, it's just really about understanding who's working with you and how can we make their lives easier so that they can provide the greatest experience possible for the folks that they're going to be serving. So we've talked a lot about um, these, uh, these directions of customer centricity coming from the top down and also from the bottom up. What if you're in the middle? What if you're a junior or a mid-level employee how do you help your company move in this direction? Well, I think they, these folks may be the ones that are getting, you know, the most interaction with the, the frontline employees, but also getting the, the kind of the directives and reporting back to the management folks. So in, in a certain instances, they actually have a, a unique perspective because they, they are, you know, kind of supporting everybody. So it's really important for them them, you know, to, to make sure that they're able to, to speak directly to management about what's going on, about how, why these policies or these kind of uh, changes are taking place, and being able to kind of use uh, their traditional um, experiences of dealing with management while, you know, kind of adopting some of the newer things that are taking place between the employees and the customers. And, and, uh, and learning those things. So they're in a unique role. They can learn those new things and, and keep that in mind and then use their traditional communication skills with management to let management know what's going on. And that way they kind of know more about everything. They know more about management and what's going on with them. And they also know about what's really going on with, you know, with the employees on the front lines creating these experiences. So they, they have a unique skill set learn the new stuff, learn what's, what's going on on the customer side, and then translate back you know, with the more traditional speaking, help the, the management understand what's going on and, and try to bring them along quicker as well. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tough spot to be in, but it's a spot that's also rife with opportunity to be really impactful in both directions. 
So it takes we some are new getting a lot of what? I said it takes some new skill sets on their behalf too. It's it, you know it, it, they have to use what they know, but they also have to pick up what's going on because they have to support those folks and on the. On the on the front lines, they really have to support mm -hmm. them, but they have to be able to, you know, to to report back to management in a way that they'll understand uh, what's going on. Yeah, That's, that, that could be a tough job. Learning, learning to influence. That could be a topic yeah. for a whole other webinar. <laughs> Uh, so we're, we're getting a ton of questions, but there is one other uh, there is one other theme that is coming up, with, which is a lot around resource constraints. So there, you know, many many customer service teams have a lot of challenges in terms of the resources that are available to them to be able to do everything that they want to do to build a better customer experience. Do you have any? advice or a take on how to make the most of your resources, whether that falls under the category of being better at community or self-service or, or where those kinds of teams really focus their efforts. Yeah, I, I tend to believe if you can focus on find, identifying some quick wins, some, you know, being able to leverage uh, some of the information and, and showing how you are able to turn that information into a quick win that typically allows you know and of course you, that may have to be translated into uh, some of those more traditional metrics of shorter handle time or you're able to do more upsells or more efficient cross sales or you're lowering the cost of acquisition because you're seeing more referrals coming in um, you have you want to find a way to do a quick win and that way you can report back and say, this is what we did, you know, just with this. Now, if we can get our more, more resources, this is our plan going forward and what it, how it can impact, you know, the business going forward. Yeah, the, those quick wins give you momentum that you can build on. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. And just as a reminder, we do a customer service trends webinar every month from Desk.com. Uh, so you uh, will probably get another email about them. We also do webinars more about the specifics of the Desk.com product and how it can help you. But for today, thank you so much, Brent, for joining us to talk more about how to become customer centric to deliver better experiences so that you can learn to examine and re-examine your customer experiences over and over to constantly get better, to actively seek feedback from your customers and even your employees with structure so that there's a standard way that you're getting all of that information and incorporating it, and then developing those key processes to provide better service so that you can stay 100% focused on your customers. Thank you everyone for your questions, and we hope to see you again next month.